Hey guys, it's Kimberly from Keep the Tail Wagging, and I am here with Dee Dee Mercer Moffat. Did I get that spelled, pronounced right? Yes. <laughs> of Raw Dog Food and Company, and I discovered Dee Dee just a few days ago when another blogger wrote about the fact that there is a podcast about raw feeding. So thank you so much for agreeing to come on with me at such short notice. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm honored to be here. I've been following your blog for a long time, so... It's great to finally sit here and, and talk with you. And oh, fantastic. So um, as an owner of a dog food company, a raw feeding company, have you um, seen the uh, increase in awareness of raw feeding and inquiries? Absolutely. I mean, it's like we're at a tipping point. You know, I don't know. I, I know you started a long time ago. I started feeding raw back in 2001. Honestly, I didn't know anything about it. And I've done, uh, there was a company that was actually putting raw food together. I didn't even think they're in business anymore, but it was back in 2001. So I've kind of gone the gamut of Frank and Frey, you know, the blends, I've done it all. But in the last three years alone, um, I have just seen this incredible increase. Um, and I don't think that people really understand maybe why they're going raw, which is why they still need to read blogs like yours and listen to podcasts. Um, but they, they know that something's not right. Um, so, yes, the word is getting out. There's less fear. Um, you know, we that started way back, and there's some people that even started back, you know, 1994, 30 years ago, that sort of thing. They were really standing alone. They were really the pioneers uh, having to stand in a crowd where people sort of looked at you like you had two heads. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely, I see um, that raw is going to do nothing but go up. And, and, and Kimberly, we're still a very, very, very small part of the pet food industry, maybe 1%. So we've got a lot of work to do. Absolutely. So what I loved about every single thing that you said is the fact that we have been feeding raw for a short time, you and I, compared to so many other people out there. And whenever I'm a little overwhelmed by the amount of information out there, I'm just blown away by the people who have been feeding raw for 10, 15, 20 years and the fact that they really had nothing to start from. And um, what I really am so excited about is the fact that you have a podcast and that is just going to help so many people and introduce them to the concept and all the complexities of raw feeding. What made you start a podcast? Well, I used to podcast... Um Several years ago, when I first started my speaking career, so I'm a motivational leadership speaker in corporate America. That's where I came from. Um, and I had a show called The Snap Out of It Show. And so I was doing podcasts back then. And, you know, what I've basically done, Kimberly, is taking, taken all the knowledge that I have from my years of feeding, this business that we have, my years on stage of speaking and podcasting, and just moved it over into this world because this is what I'm really, really passionate about. Don't get me wrong. I love to help people snap out of it, but, um, and be motivated and, you know, do the things that they love, but I love animals like you do. And I think that it's so, um, heart centered. It's so much more heart centered. So I just, um, and also I think that, um, consumers, customers, they sort of guide you. So you're getting and I'm getting lots of questions, the same exact questions almost every single day from 20, 25 people. And so I thought, mm -hmm. you know what? The better uh, medium is to put this out in podcasts. You're doing blogs. Um, you know, we put a lot of stuff out on our Facebook page. But I got to tell you, a lot of people don't read these days, it seems like, you know, because we'll have stuff up on our website and they'll, they'll ask me the same question. When So you have to put it out there in all these different mediums, whether that's a blog, a podcast or videos, because everybody learns in different ways. So um, I just, I love it. It's fun. I love to have fun with, uh, with my uh, customers too. Yeah. And I love what you said, because it's so very true. This year I started doing more with YouTube, because not everyone wants to read things. Not everyone has time to read things. If you try to read a full article on your smartphone, it's sometimes impossible for some of us because it's tiny and it's just too much and it's overwhelming. And but I can actually just start a video in my car and let it go through the speakers as I'm driving and get the same information. So I love that we have all of these avenues to learn about something rather than just a book or just a raw feeding group. Um, so when we were emailing back and forth, you mentioned that your daughter is in veterinarian school. And I think that that is fascinating because 
you know, we are told that um, their education when it comes to animal nutrition is very limited. And to have a mom that owns a raw food company, you know, what types of conversations are you guys having about nutrition? Well, she actually graduated uh, two years ago. So she's been in practice. She just bought a uh, mobile practice in Rifle, Colorado, and she is now doing uh, large animals. So she's doing horses and she's doing cows. And I don't know how she, you know, does it because she's got her hand inside of a, you know, cow's booty half the time doing price check. <laughs> but uh, it was very interesting, you know, and, and I, so I understand why vets um, maybe are against the raw. Number mm -hmm. one, we watched how they were trained in school. The nutrition classes are put on by the big uh, companies who have a vested interest not only in the research but in the manufacturing of dry food and we're talking about prescription food as well so pills science diet arena all those guys uh, they are leading the nutrition courses and they're still doing that today now remember i said that she just graduated two years ago we're not talking about 10 years ago yeah. uh, we're talking about two years ago and so what we know is they're broke Okay, first of all, let me just say this. Vet school is extremely, extremely hard. Anybody that's in vet school has no life. They have no life for four years, right? They're studying. And if you flunk one class, you're out. Oh, wow. So they've got their heads in the books. They come out of vet school. They've got debt up to the you know eyeballs. And now they've got to get themselves into a clinic so that they can start paying back that loan. When they go into a clinic, now you've got a senior vet in there who also came out of vet school many years ago without the nutrition classes. But you know what? He's got a financial profit. He's got a financial reason for selling that dog food. And now you get into a cycle. You're a new vet. You're working for someone. All you want to do is start making your money. You're not going to want to hit the books and get a PhD in nutrition. So what do we do? Conformity is the way that most people live their lives. There's a great uh, show out there called Minefield, and there's one on conformity. And if you watch that, it very much is what's happening or what has happened in the dog food world. It's just the way everyone does it. So let's just go along because nobody wants to feel like odd man out. Mm -hmm. So this is what we see within um the, the veterinary world and you know Tom Longsdale you know Tom Longsdale who's yes. the dog of bone you know he very much came out against the Australian vet um, universities and man they came down hard on him but if you watch some of his uh, videos and even the conferences that are going on today mm -hmm. are being their headliners their keynoters are the people who are being who are on the payroll of some of the largest pet food manufacturer companies. Oh, wow. So um, when it comes to, that's the question, it's amazing. It comes up in my group, um, Rock Eaters Kicked Out Club, probably at least once a week, because I write for the people who were me five years ago, who are just right. becoming interested in rock eating, who are brand new. And the question comes like, oh, no, I need to take my dog to the vet. Do I have to tell them about that I'm feeding raw or what do I say? How can I get this across? Basically, how can I come out as a raw feeder? Um, what advice do you have or, you know, does your daughter share through you? So I would say this. You have to understand when maybe to tell them that you're feeding raw. There are a lot of people. Okay. If, uh, let's just say you're going in for a general checkup and, and the vet says, Oh my gosh, your dog looks great. The coat looks great. The teeth are magnificent. The blood work is coming back. It's beautiful. What are you feeding if they say that? Now you have the option right there to say, you know, I just cannot remember what that brand is that I'm feeding and let it go. Or if your dog is having blood work and the blood values are a little bit higher, we know that creatine and bun levels are going to be higher on the raw diet, then maybe you do want to say, hey, I am feeding raw. You need to understand, does your vet understand how to read the blood work of when you are a, a, a raw you know, parent, a raw feeding parent? But so you got to pick your battles. But if your vet, let's say you take your dog in, and this is one of the things that I see most often that happens. Mm -hmm. um, we have new feeders, all right? 
they get they switch over and the dog's the dog's gut isn't in the best possible yeah. position right now we got vomiting we got some diarrhea mm -hmm. all of a sudden because they have a belief that says oh my gosh bacteria e coli they run to the vet the vet says what are you feeding they're saying i'm feeding wrong they said don't feed wrong they go oh my gosh okay they go back to kibble it's yes. crazy right so here's the thing if if a vet says i do not advocate raw i would i would say why mm -hmm. what tell me why and the first thing that typically they're going to say is bacteria you know, E. coli, salmonella. And I would say this to them, okay, I get it, but there's 2,400 different, you know, strands of salmonella. There's only four that are pathogenic. Um, and aren't dogs' guts, you know, the acid, aren't they able to handle that? Now, the next thing that they're going to say is, yes, but it could be dangerous to someone in your family, mm -hmm. human beings, your kids. And you want to say, really? How is that? Because, you know, even dry fed dogs, their poop contains somewhere around, I don't know how many, 23 million fecal coliforms. Okay. So it doesn't, unless your dog is, you know, your kids are playing in the poop or eating poop or whatever, mm. that's really not an issue either. So I would get very educated. And Kimberly, here's the thing. Do you know where the anti-raw policy came from in the... No, I do not. Well, let me just tell you this little secret here. So there was a group by the name of, of um, I forget their actual name, but what they are is, is pet partners. Okay, they're pet partners. So they have therapy dogs, therapy dogs that go out and do great work in the world. But in 2008, uh, 2010, therapy dogs just all of a sudden came to the uh, advisory board of the uh, American Veterinarian Society. And they said, do you have a, a raw policy for therapy dogs? And the veterinarian you know, uh, organization association said, well, no, but maybe we should. Now, here's what's then, then, then the policy got enacted, right, in 2012. Yeah. But here's, here's the interesting thing. When pet partners came forward and asked that question, which started this policy going along, there was a person sitting on their board, on pet partners board that worked for Purina. And it just happened that that year, Purina gave a $400,000 grant to pet partners. Okay. Now, let's <laughs> Let's, let me just give you another little caveat here. In 2008, prior to this person sitting on the board with Pet Partners, who was a part of Purina, in 2008, Pet Partners did their own research where they had raw-fed dogs and dry-fed dogs, kibble-fed dogs, to see which one had more pathogens. Mm -hmm. What they found was that the dry uh, or pathogenic bacteria what they found was that the dry fed dogs had three more bacteria that they held than the kibble fed dogs. So you tell me, was this anti-raw policy based on scientific research of which they say, or was it based on a financial gain? So basically dogs fed a diet of dry dog food had more pathogens than dogs fed a raw. Yes. What they did was they, they looked at the fecal matter. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so they were trying to figure out who's going to have more pathogens because of course they're taking them into maybe immune compromised facilities. Mm -hmm. So they knew prior to this that dry fed dogs were carrying more uh, bacteria than in their mouth, in their poop, right? Whatever. Than the raw fed dogs. And it's interesting because, yeah, that's the another question is someone is like, well, I have a therapy dog and I'm not able to feed my dog raw and have him work in the state that we're in. Right. And so that's, I oh, that's so fascinating because, um, you know, if, you know, of course, you know, we all feel it, you know, where our way of being is under attack. And I know I didn't send this question to you when I was thinking of it, it just came to me now, was as a raw brand, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about, you know, basically the pressure 
of the FDA on raw brands to basically, I don't know. It's just like, I don't exactly know what they want you to do except for just cease to exist. Well, so here's the thing. The FDA has a new little device, a new little device that is very, very sensitive to salmonella, right? And they can come in at any time, pull some product and test it for salmonella. It probably is going to test for salmonella. Heck, there's salmonella everywhere. There's salmonella in the chicken that you get mm -hmm. at the grocery store. But of course, they know that we're going to cook that. But listen, if 10% of all the poultry that we eat can contain salmonella, why do we have a no tolerance policy for animals who were created to begin to break down the bacteria in their mouth and then their acid is so incredibly high that they can just, you know, kill all those bacteria unless they are immune compromised. Yes. But, but I think it is, it is concerning. Uh, we just heard that Vital Essentials has now gone HPP. 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 And, you know, so what, what is that? HPP is killing the live enzymes that make raw dog food uh, really the amazing thing that it is. So, yeah, it is very scary. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, you have to make the decision whether you're going to be sort of this under-the-radar company um, or you're going to do what we are doing, which is videos and webinars and all that sort of thing. I think one of the things that does concern me, Kimberly, is that there are a lot of people that jump into this business that don't know what they're doing. And, and, and I think that you have to be connected with manufacturers that are testing, who are reputable, who are utilizing, um, you know, safe handling practices and, and, and um, how they treat the animals too, you know, the humane uh, way of harvesting. Mm -hmm. um, I know some people that are out there today, some companies that are making it out of their garage. Yeah. So that does concern me because if they're not doing it correctly, then we all get lumped into one big, yeah. you know, uh, bucket of bacteria. <laughs> it's so very true because I, with the recalls that started, of course, they happen every winter. Um, and, you know, my followers, you know, their thing is, and their initial reaction is obviously there's something wrong with this company. And I have to kind of, you know, through information, pull everyone back to say, you know, it's kind of hard not to have a recall with an organization that has a zero tolerance policy, because we all know that of course there's going to be pathogens in the raw. You got to think about what will they find if they come to my kitchen? I make my own. So what will they find when they come to my kitchen? And probably a whole heck of a lot more bacteria than they would at a company if they're doing it right. So that the thought of someone, cause I do, I get emails every now and then from someone, a brand new company that's, you know, making a raw diet. And I, Used to be super excited about it. I still am, but I still, the questions that you put out there of, you know, where are you sourcing it? How are you making it? How are you making sure that, you know, your area is safe? How are you balancing it? I have a lot of questions because I do think that part of it is people being passionate and wanting to make a product because I feel that way about my dogs. I feel like it saved, you know, Rodrigo's life. But then on the flip side, people jumping into a really popular way of feeding their dogs and, you know, getting that piece of the pie and maybe not realizing how expensive it has to be to start a dog food company and then cutting corners. Absolutely. And we are going to see um, more issues of salmonella for the reason that I just said. But here's the mm -hmm. thing. Like you said, just because they had a recall, for salmonella were there any dogs that were actually harmed um and you have to even go further what were, were those pet parents actually using safe handling um you know techniques were they mixing kibble and raw was this immune compromised dog was this dog getting lots of vaccines? Is he on lots of antibiotics? Mm -hmm. So we can't get tunnel vision. And this is the thing. We really get tunnel vision and we just focus on the food. And that's one of the things, you know, in my new feeder webinars that are coming up, it's like, listen, people, we cannot do that. You cannot just focus on the food. You know, you probably get these questions all the time. My dog's itching. What's causing that? And I'm like, well, do you have time to answer these 50 questions <laughs> I have for you? 
you know, and what you find out is that it's they're going to daycare and the daycare's feeding them these uh, milk bones. Mm -hmm. But they thought it was a beef blend. And now they're going to pull all the beef blend out of the dog's diet. It's not people. Snap yeah. out of it. You know? <laughs> right. And the thing about it is that that's why I always tell people, yes, you know, go to the community and get people's feedback. That's how I learned how to feed raw. You know, a combination of talking to veterinarians who supported a raw diet and talking to other people who have been feeding raw. However, I learned quickly that you have to follow up everything that you learn with your own homework. I got an email this morning. Someone's dog, brand new to raw, has diarrhea. Everyone told her it was a chicken intolerance. And it's like, you can't know that yet. You know, and you're, you're adding too many ingredients to the bowl. You dial it back and start from scratch again. And I was like, oh, so should I go ahead and add the supplements? No, no, you're just starting. <laughs> it's a puppy. <laughs> What are they on? Now get this list of supplements. And so I say this about supplements. Uh, I say, what are you supplementing for? Yes. Are we presenting in a way that says, yes, I need a supplement. Okay. Because more is not better, people. And yes. If you truly believe in raw, the food should be doing its job. Yes. Okay. Look, we we have access and, and we, we are going to be... Um, we, we can do the standard process, you know, because of our daughter being the vet and she's kind of along beside us. So we, we have those supplements and we haven't put them out there yet. We will. But here's the thing. I still um, think that you better have a darn good reason for supplementing. You yeah. Know what I'm saying? And so, it's true. When I started, well, four or five years ago, you should have seen the kitchen when I was feeding the dogs. I look like a crazy person. My boyfriend said the kitchen looked like a mad scientist laboratory. I was adding things because every time someone said, well, are you adding this? Well, you better. I would run out and buy it. And then one day, and, and then I kept going for years. And then all of a sudden I would ask myself, well, or someone would ask me, why are you feeding that? I didn't know. Chuck it. Chuck it. And now it's like I have a couple of bottles on my counter and it's mostly like raw sardines, raw eggs, goat's milk. And I buy a supplement based on what my dogs actually need. And right. it's cheaper. It takes less time. I don't have a judgy audience of four dogs staring me down as I'm like, I'm going as fast as I can. Here's this pill. Here's this ointment. And, you know, and it's, but it is, it's, and I know everyone means well. I mean, our ultimate goal is, um, you know, we want our dogs to live longer and we're also terrified. Thank you. You know, the veterinarian community, of killing our dogs and not giving them what they need. And so we end up going overboard. And like you said, more is not better. It's, it's just more expensive. It is expensive. It is so expensive. And the other thing that I try to get back to people, did mother nature make flaxseed? <laughs> did my, I, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I'm not going to just kill flaxseed totally, but I, I mean, I, when they start, I'm not, yep. What we're, if we're doing a pre model here, did Mother Nature supply this? You know what I'm saying? So let's start looking at it that way. And um, there's a financial, look, marketing, oh my gosh. I mean, people go, well, I've been Rachel Ray. And I said, she sure does love her colorings, doesn't she? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, look, Rachel Ray has nothing to do with this. You know what I mean? The marketing people, the manufacturing people, the sales people, the, but they're all so separate. It's all. But, I hear this all the time, but I'm feeding, I'm feeding a premium kibble. Yes. And I say, what is that? What, what is that? I love that. You know, spend a lot of money for crap. Yeah. I mean, I was the same way. I thought that if it was, I, cause you know, I went to business school. So the best products are going to be at eye level. So I needed to get something that was at eye level or above because those are the higher products. <laughs> I want it, you know, and then I'm, I'm a sucker for colors. I'm a sucker for colors and pictures. So if it's a pretty package, you know, Heels got me a few years ago with their ideal balance. And I am such a sucker because the package looked like, you know, oh, it's sort of natural and it looks kind of like a grocery bag brown color with these nice browns and a whole chicken on it and some vegetables in the corner. Not did once did I turn that, huh? Did you find that chicken in the bag? No, that's just it. Not once did I turn the bag over and read the ingredients. This is like before I was awakened. This is back when I was still, you know, writing. I would write about what I was feeding my dogs, but I would also write about kibble here and there too. And then one day, 
I was at the pet store trying to prove a point to myself and turned over a bag and it wasn't heels, it was something else. And I was astounded. And then I kept turning like, you know, they probably thought I was, you know, you know, is she crazy? Did corporate send her here? And I was just like, I can't promote this anymore. And the more I started learning about the ingredients in dog food, I just couldn't get behind it. You know, one thing you said earlier, and I'm trying to remember it in the back of my head, which I loved, was, oh, about, you know, when your dog is getting sick because you're feeding raw, and you're asking yourself the questions about, you know, you know, did the dog have, you know, vaccinations that day? Does the dog have an immunocompromised system? You know, does, did the dog, um, another thing that you said, it just brought to mind Scout. Scout had a fever of unknown origin. The fever burned everything out of the system. So I took him off of raw for a week and home cooked for him. And it's, those things that that's what comes to mind when I see a recall and a dog does get sick or a dog does die is there are just so many things that, um, that add to that. It's like, it's not just the food. And I just really appreciated the statement that you said that we have to look beyond the food when we're looking at these type of stories. Well, we have to look at inhalant allergies, contact allergies, fungal, um, it, you know, allergies. So there are all types of things. And the thing about it is, is I think that all people really need to learn how to take their dog's temperature, mm -hmm. test for, um, you know, blood pressure. So you lift the lid up, you press on the gums. If it turns white and then comes back pink, we're fine. You know, um, also, you know, feel the pulse, you know, inside that back leg. So we got to take some vitals. And so, it, you know, look, dogs throw up. Dogs have diarrhea. We do have to watch out for dehydration. Mm -hmm. You know, a dog can survive parvo, but parvo, the reason that dogs die with parvo is because they get dehydrated. So mm -hmm. these are sort of the things that we've got to understand. And if your dog uh, is sick, yes, we want to look at those vitals, take them off raw, put them on a bland diet. But if you run back to the vet and you get on antibiotics, now we've just screwed up the gut mm -hmm. biome again. Yep. Right? It's a vicious cycle. So I think that we have to stop blaming the raw. Yes. You want to be vigilant. You want to know who you're buying from, uh, and and but get outside that box. Yeah, get outside the dog bag. Yeah. So I am asking everyone this question for National Raw Feeding Week, and that is, where do you think eighty ten ten came from? I have no idea. No <laughs> idea. <laughs> I think it really came from people um, looking at wolves and how wolves really ate. And if you look at how they ate, the majority of their food was meat and bone, mm -hmm. meat and bone. I mean, that's mostly, it. and yes, they ate the organs. And then you got to look at, you know, the size of the animal and sort of how the, uh, ratios line out versus the beef and the meat and the fur and the bones and the organs. And, and then I think that people just started saying, how much bone can my dog actually eat? Now I want to say this, we have two models. We have your prey model. We have your barf model. As you know, barf is going to be, you know, almost double the bone content. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, all dogs are different. Do I think that 80-10-10 is the Bible? Absolutely not. Come on. You know, you've got Tom Longsdale who feeds raw meaty bones. What, 75-80% raw meaty bones. Um, so I think you have to look at your dog. Um, they are carnivores. We're going to do the meat thing the most. Those organs are your multivitamins. You got to have bone in there. Listen, people, I see people ordering stuff boneless, boneless, boneless. I'm like, where's your calcium? We've got to have the calcium phosphorus ratio going on here. So um, I think that it just evolved like this has evolved. And mm -hmm. somebody said, listen, I think this is pretty close. Dogs seem to be able to eat this much bone, you know, at the by the way, puppies need 15%, right? We need about 15% calcium mm -hmm. bone in there. Um, so you see, that's not always right. exact. So don't try to be exact. If your dog can't poop, pull back on the bone. <laughs> <laughs> the bone in there. So anyway, yeah. So I, I, I really, you know, I, when you asked me that question, I was doing a lot of research on it too. And there's no one answer that nobody's <laughs> taken the, Hey, I started the eight. Yes. <laughs> right? Nobody's. It, it, it. So I really do think 
if we look at where this whole thing came from, it came from how do wolves eat? Our canis mm-hmm. lupus, we're the, you know, the dogs, that's their ancestor. How did they eat? So if we're going to go back there, then they generalized, I would say. To Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's interesting because that's exactly the answer everyone is giving me, which I love. It's basically our starting point. And while I know I'm an analytical person by heart, I love my spreadsheets. Oh, <laughs> I love my spreadsheets. I love doing all these things. I, I love it. And um, so I understand wanting to do the math of 80, 10, 10. When I wrote my book, I have a chapter that explains how how people can break that down and it's the biggest regret of that book because although I say but you know this is just for you ner- math nerds out there and you know and you want to balance over time it's still people latch on to that and I totally understand because I did as well and what I found and, and I guess I have a really great study case here is I could feed you know and I'm not exactly 80 10 10 but you know pretty close one of my dogs or two of my dogs is not going to do perfect. So as you stated, someone's either going to have soft stool or someone's going to be constipated just a little. So they're going to either need more or less bone or more or less organ meat. And it's just not exact. So it's just our starting point. Right. And then we adjust accordingly. Yeah. That's what I always tell my folks when, you know, they say, should I go barf or should I go pray? And I said, well, we don't know until we get it in your dog. Yes. Um, I probably wouldn't stay on barf. Um, consistently because it is so high in the bone content i like for you to you know go barf and maybe finish that chub and then go to pray or maybe do two pray mm-hmm. and let's see how how we how we work it's the same thing with how much to feed well i don't know my german shepherd which is this this girl right here um she you know a german shepherd her size should probably eat somewhere around 24 ounces a day but she's just a pretty girl who does nothing and uh, she does go on hikes, but she tore her ACL mm-hmm. and we healed that naturally. So we keep her thinner. So she eats about 19 ounces, you know, so we can't be exact. And for God's sakes, we're the dogs in the wild. Say, well, I cannot eat. I cannot. I had my fill yesterday. I'm not going to be. What, what was that calculation? Oh, thank you. Thank you <laughs> I cannot take down that fox today. <laughs> Hold the bone, please. <laughs> I know. I'm feeling a little constipated. And so maybe I'm just not going to do the bone. I'll just do the meat. You can have my portion because I noticed you were a little loose. Give me a liver. <laughs> <laughs> but wait a minute. Is that chicken liver? Because I got a little intolerance. So <laughs> Yes, you got me quail because I really like the quail. I swear that's how my dogs are just because that's. That's the conversation that I have in my head when I'm ordering things and stuff because they are so, <laughs> and the fact that it took me so long to fast them because I'm just like, they're going to be starving. They're, they're sleeping. They're I fine. actually had someone who said, I can't, I, I, and I don't, I don't say, hey, fast your dog. You don't have to fast your dog before you go on the raw. But for some reason they read something. They were I just cannot do it to my dogs. I can't. And I'm like, listen, people. You know your dogs. I mean, they could live. They could live fourteen, fifteen days, probably longer. There's, there's a woman out there um, that says, a skinny dog, that a dog could live fifty days without any food, and not water. Fifty days without any food. There's a study. There's a study done. I don't remember who did it. Where a dog, they tried to see, and a dog was over a hundred days without food, and they actually canceled the study because they were like, "We're," and the dog was still active and happy and playing and everything. Because we we store those vitamins and minerals until we need them, right? Mm-hmm. And so we pull them out of the body, and then all the organs kick in. So why are you fasting in the first place? So let me ask you this: Tell me the benefits of fasting, Kimberly. Ah, because 80% of our immune system lives in our gut. We cannot make our gut continually digest food. It doesn't allow our immune system to do what it needs to do if our gut is always working. So we give our gut a break so the immune system can do its job. Gosh, I mean, I've been doing it for a week, just doing 16 hours of fasting where most of it I'm sleeping or half of it, and then eight hours I can eat. I can pretty much eat whatever I want to eat. And I feel fantastic. I'm clear-headed. I'm focused. 
I lost weight in the first week. And I, I have allergies this time of year. They're not bothering me. I mean, I'm sleeping great. And this is just one week. If I feel this type of improvement over one week, imagine what our dogs, who really are overfed, Regardless of if you feed dry food or raw, we do tend to overfeed because they're cute and they're looking at us. So we're going to give them a little bit more and we're feeding them too much. And if their gut is always working, we're seeing itchy skin and we're seeing the diarrhea or the loose stool or we're seeing the, the protein intolerances. We're seeing a lot of health, you know, the joint issues, the constant inflammation because their immune system is too busy distracted while the gut is at work. So let the gut take a vacation so the gut biome can start working to grow and multiply and the immune system can be like, okay, so let me tackle that inflammation issue you got going over there. Are you going to keep doing it? Are you yep. going to keep it personally? Yep, personally. I, I, I don't think I'll do it every day, but I think I'll do it at least three, three four days a week and, don't, and just see how it feels. It just... It just started once I was it's so much I've learned from my dogs and feeding my dogs has really changed the way I eat and, you know, what I do for myself. And every single time, you know, I'm not eating raw meat, but, you know, every single time what I put in my body or how I treat myself, it just makes me feel so much better. And it's like, if I feel this way, then I definitely need to pass this on to my dogs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So I want to say thank you so very much for joining me. I know I got you last minute. I really appreciate you being so flexible and sitting with me today. And I know this went longer than I said it was going to be, but this was so much fun talking to you. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kimberly. And I want to read your book. What's the name of your book again? Yeah, it's A Novice's Guide to Raw Feeding for Dogs. Awesome. By Kimberly. By Kimberly Gautier. Hey, okay. Now I know how to say it, Kimberly. I know. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you.